Hello there, everyone, and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in Kazaridux. Yeah, it's Kazaridux still, in which we're playing as the good old nation of Afghanistan, the graveyard of empires. Um, so we're playing as Habibullah Khan, but we're going to try to get the route of Nasrul Khan and supposedly, eventually, maybe form the Mughal Empire. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I played as Afghanistan before in Kazaridux, um, but I think I went red Afghanistan, so it's different, different route for us this time. Uh, so we need this route, so defeat Delhi in the Fourth Anglo War, and then in some sort of event, the ascension of the Crown Prince, uh, refuse to investigate this, some guy's death. So we gotta get into the war first, but I would like to read the events because it's been a while since I played this. We need a lot more guns, too. Oh my god, we need a lot more guns. Um, so, Amanullah Khan, son of Habibullah, arrived in Istanbul earlier today. When Amalua landed in Istanbul, he was immediately taken aback by its glory and grandeur. The Queen of Cities easily get, loves up to her name. He is greeted by a government delegation with a smart and clean honor guard and is first taken around the city for a few hours as the Sultan is said to be asleep. He eats the best food he has in some time, visited numerous historical sites, answered questions asked by throngs of foreign reporters, and finally has his midday prayers in the Hagia Sophia. When he is done, he is taken to the Sultan and the two headed off well. The Sultan asks about the war and how Afghanistan is doing with Amanullah, asking about how the sublime port fares in return. The Sultan pledged to provide support to the Afghan cause by any means necessary and in turn humbly requests support. Made in the royal court that Caliph included, believe war may be coming to the Ottoman sphere of influence. The emir's son pledged to support the caliph in any way he could, Amanullah, then watched the palace guard execute parade maneuvers and the courtyard and appeared thoroughly impressed. Such discipline, such fervor. He was seen off by the sultan himself and as Amanullah sits down in his plane, all consider the visit between the two as a great success. Hopefully the friendship between the two great nations never dies. Sick man doesn't seem sick to me. Uh, so this is equipment we can buy. Mm, we need a lot of it. Sure, it may not be great. But we have four to do. And we gotta make sure that I converted these guys were originally militia. Um, but I converted them to infantry because it's just better. Amanullah in Tehran. Oh. Hold on. That sucks. And with some uh, cavalry here too. Ooh. And these guys are eight combat width. We're gonna make sure that they're royal cavalry instead. Not combat territories. Uh, travel militia. Uh, travel cavalry. A little less so Amanullah lands in Tehran for another royal visit and is immediately put off by how demonstrably hot it is. When he exits his plane, he finds it's not a grand delegation as he met elsewhere, but a small group of politicians with a small garb. They explain that the government has tied up somewhere else and such they were all who, who could meet him. He's very around the city and enjoys it despite his company. But only flown to Combs, where he observed a grand military parade followed by an inspection. Amanullah noticed the disheveled look of some of the soldiers and their disorganization despite the shouts of the commanders. The men are all too sloppy, their uniforms are the wrong size, and they conduct the military drills and maneuvers without tempo or panache. During his inspection, what was heralded as an elite division, a soldier further down the line drops his rifle and it goes off, shooting himself in the foot. The prince is insulted by such a shy reception, but does his best to contain his dissatisfaction. When he returns to the plane, he's all too happy to be out of Tehran. They think they can run the Middle East better than the Turks? Huh, fat chance. Okay, so now we have nothing here. Um, I'm still going to take some, uh, if we could. Oh, they don't like us, do they? Base reluctance. Well, I guess not that from them. Uh-huh. You guys, can we... Hmm. Well. Toto's Charter. Can we find anything up, you guys, please? There you go. Jabal Shamar. It's not much, but we need to fill our ranks. Ah, King Edward VIII. Oh, good old Khazar Redux. Amanullah returns. When Amanullah returns to Kabul, he's a changed man. He looks out of the capital and no longer left content with his visas. Visas. Vistas. He saw the magnificence of Istanbul and the squall of Tehran and is ashamed to see Kabul looking like the latter rather than the former. He's also too aware of the state of the military before the war and his visit to the Ottomans has given some ideas how to improve the situation. While Amanullah is not first in line to receive the throne, should his father abdicate or be rendered incapable, he's a man of ambition. His uncle Nasrullah, ah, as a reactionary man, would rather see Afghanistan wallow. Um, instead of uh, wallow in the same troubles that has been affected for centuries, instead of dragging it into the future. A foolish agent agenda. Amanullah Khan, one way or another, will have his throne and he will force Afghanistan way or another into the modern world. I found Kabul a city of mud. I shall leave it a city of gold. Uh, we'll see about that. The fourth Anglo-Afghan war and the remnants of the Rajshore South descend and sprung up like wildflowers in the wake of Edward VIII's succession. In Kabul, we have our own troubles in keeping the latest discontent reform down. I repeat of the third victorious third Anglo-Afghan War might in their own position whilst winning new lands as subjects for a crown. What does India have with cows? Well, we're going in. Oh, look at that. Fourth Anglo-Afghan War. 
Once more into the breach. Ah, what do we have here? Um, the war against our Indian rivals kicked off once more, therefore we must put an effort to ensure total victory. If we were to succeed, our rule would surely be in grave danger. Or not succeed. Ooh. Um... Rally the nationalists. Nationalists and radical Islamists may be upset with their regime for not following their doctrine. However, they hate the foreign imperialists more. War unifies and our enemies now, enemies and us now share an enemy. Every son and daughter of Afghanistan must put, other, put their all to defeat the imperialist. Good luck. As long as they don't mobilize fast enough, that's that's all I care about. Can we actually them? Shia Muslims flee the war? For decades, the situation of the Shia minority in Afghanistan has been bad. The post-war situation was in gold, and another war could possibly only make it worse. Shia imams in the province of Herat and Farah have encouraged the Shia minority to flee to the friendly neighbor Persia. Let's stop the Persians and them back. We need that manpower. It's writers. You know what? As long as you're not on the line, I'm good with this. And now they're showing up. God dang it. Raise the banners. War is upon us once more. Afghanistan must become unified for this war or else we all suffer, regardless of the distance from Kabul. Regardless of faction and tribe, all Afghani people must give their emir blood into all. Our very survival depends on it. We're up 5,000, eh? Sarafs have left Afghanistan. Sarafs are a group of Indian merchants who travel between Afghanistan and Delhi, exchanging money and trading goods in both for both of them. Our economy depends hardly on the visits. Now the war has come and the borders are safe no more. We only feel these Sarafs are brave enough to continue trading with us. We don't, with most of the caravans gone, we now suffer from an economic crisis. We don't need those Indian dogs anyways. Raise the banners. Al request allied support. The Germans and Ottomans have always claimed to be friends with us against Imperialists, so we must request they hold true to the promise. As of right now, we are ill prepared to equip every soldier with a rifle and we desperately need material support in order to continue the fight after the element of surprise is worn off. Um, well, we're going in. Like I said, is it, as long as they don't want to put their divisions on the line, I'm okay with that. So what do I do to win? I, I've won this before. I just don't remember what I've done. Uh huh. Just the caliph kick in the desert. The tribes placated. Uh, more than just one tribal elder is angry at a regime. Many tribes either refuse to lend their support to the emir or are reluctant in their efforts. We need the support in order to have a fighting chance, so we will fill their ears with the promises of wealth and prosperity should our combined efforts succeed. The tricks in arms. As the troops are over, the crates arrive with masses of artillery. They are awed by the craftsmanship. The tricks promise us weapons and they are delivered in spades. We begin immediately to disperse them into our soldiers on the front, and with these weapons straight from the caliph, Allah will surely look upon us favorably. Allahu Akbar. And so same thing with the Germans. Rifles by Kreta, and ammo by the box, and artillery by the pallet. All arrive at the Kabul airport by board German planes. The almost state of art weapons of war are far cry from what we were used to previously, and to such a manner will require a lot of retraining to properly use them. Despite this, we can now find a more equal terms with our enemy and a greater chance of victory. Maybe one day we can repay them. You know, they don't want to show up. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with this. I am totally okay with this. Hello. Great opportunity here. Deutsche Luftwaffe, Deutsche Luft Expedition in Afghanistan. Our friends in Germany are eyeing our war extensively as top brass and institutes of war are setting our engagements to better improve their doctrines. We shall request an increased correspondence as well as support from the Luft Expedition. With men and their air wings at our backs, we will fare better against Anton's technological advantage. Uh, we're losing political power here. Yeah, we are. Center of the army, solidify control. We could go to partial mob. Um, but I want some. Some of this, maybe, or some of this. Special forces, artillery. Recovery rate's not bad either. I want them to recover faster, potentially. Agriculture crisis. See? Like I said, if they don't want to show up, I'm okay with it. Endorsement by the Caliph. Well, as the Caliph in Constantinople to sponsor jihad that conquered Delhi from the imperialists. True Muslims around the world will answer to the call of the arms against infidels and let us support in both blood and steel. The Luft expedition arrives. The Germans have sent help. The so called Luft expedition has arrived in Kabul at a seemingly an equal amount of cheers and jeers. The roar of a regiment of the finest planes of the world is a beautiful sound. These German air wings and volunteers have been drilled in the desert warfare during a stopover in Aleppo and as such are not totally out of their element. However, it was a mishap, as a German bomber bounced off of the makeshift airbase in Kabul before crashing to the ground. 
The plane's landing gear was ripped off by the bump in uneven surface before the nose was sent careening into the dirt. In any case, German advisors are already discussing with the military brass how to best utilize the expedition. Groups centered around the remnants of the newly revitalized Niedermeyer Hentic expedition have welcomed these pasty white men with open arms. Traditional elements within the nation still regard them with suspicion. Habibullah has built their reputation of being the lapdog of the Hun, and their new developments within our emirate seem to confirm to the tale. It remains to be seen whether the German uh, uh, elements within the nation will lead a victory or disgrace. Willkommen Waffenbrüder. Oh, look at that, great. You know, a lot of left to move. Good. Do what you can here. Help him out. I do not want to get circled, but we've done a pretty good job going around him so far. How much do we need to do to win? Wrath of the Khan. Exile King. Kick in the door. The Daily Regime is weak internally, and with only the Imperialist Garrison holding the rotten structure up. We've been holding partisans of the Provisional Government for years. Now it's time for them to approve their usefulness. Send in some collaboration of the Provisional Government, and it'll just stabilize them from the inside. Jihad in the dress from Constantinople. The Caliph has declared a war against the Raj as a jihad to break the free the shackled faithful under British imperialism. To the jubilant Ottoman crowds, the Sultan Abdul Musaid II unleashed a tirade against a centuries long British yoke under the Indian subcontinent and demanded that self determination be granted to the Indian population. This has been an immediate boon to our efforts as pious Muslims from across the region and in fact the world began arriving in Kabul to join a struggle. Our airports and travel stops are overrun by pilgrims and warriors who seek, who seek Allah's glory by supporting our struggle. Moreover, a counter movement led by Emir of Mecca decried this as a purely political maneuver by the Sultan to gain influence in the region, and the Ottoman rivals in Cairo have condemned the caliph's actions. Political play or not, the results are undeniable, as the wars from around the Islamic world come to aid. Inshallah. New Pope, eh? Ah, yes. Uh... Really don't want to get cut off. Maybe we make it and circumvent and kill him here. That'd be great. Send in the hounds. Not all Indians accept the rule of the Raj. Within our nation resides provisional government of India, a native resistance group dedicated to finishing the destruction of the Raj. We gave them refuge in our nation long ago. However, they've long wasted away in exile, never finding an opportunity to strike at the Raj nor return home. Now the war been broken out, we finally found a reason to use them. They shall be smuggled back into their homeland to commit acts of sabotage and riotous sedition to drive wider enemies' attention. The Raj for all their faults are much bigger with us than us, and with their undivided attention will surely fall. With them feeling the heat of the new air fire in the rear, however, we will surely gain a righteous victory. Who knows, maybe they'll even gain power in the ruins of the Raj, united against imperialism. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, with that being said, we're throwing Artie on you guys. And you guys, too. It'd be great if you could get there. See this power in Mexico, it's fine. Help us out here, help us out. Go here first. Hey, we actually got them guys. Nice, not bad. Tronics. I thought they would have more divisions than this, but whatever. Center of the army. Equally stability, patron autocracy. I'd rather go here. Early mob. Can we buy any more guns? That'd be nice. I'd say we're doing all right. I don't think we got any planes, did we? Not like we got fuel. Why did you go there then? Ah. They win the Russian elections, it's fine, whatever. That's you know, a giant mess, but I guess it's our giant mess, you know. Well, at least we're doing okay-ish. 
This is not that bad, actually, for some reason. And... Okay! I'm okay with this so far. Hello, that's not ideal. Support weapons. Oh, the Kingdom of France? Sounds familiar. He's dead. He falls into socialism. Okay, we at least saved him. That's good. Go here. You can probably cut him off. Potentially. Good. Seriously, when do we win this war? Come on. Help him out. Good, we got him too. Can you help here? No? Okay, well then so be it. Follow the Kingdom of Finland. Alrighty then. That's a good good way to grant XP. Oh, well, I guess we're gonna go to Delhi then. We're gonna circle quite a few of them, which actually has been pretty pretty nice overall. Third Treaty of Ralapindi. Victories are ours, a decade of British lapdogs in Delhi have been utterly routed and our forces entrenched on the smoldering remains of the capital. Now might be the best time to demand concessions whilst we can still carry the lead. I should be the emancipator and liberator of all Bohemians in the Indus Valley. Can I kill them off more? I just kind of want to kill them off at this point. And it's great for army XP. Now, Mavi, remember that, please go ahead. Boop. Darn it. Hey, look at that. We actually did really well. Go figure. Oh, I forgot about this. Um, this is cheaper to produce. We give more defense for this one and breakthrough and soft attack and I think it's just better here. You can have trains, support equipment. Oh, we would have that. Oopsie. God dang it. So now what? So we won. The Wrath of Khan. The Khan has led us to victory over the Imperialists, however, not as all well in our lands. There's so many upstarts that typically seize power for themselves in the instability between dissenting groups. Most of these who question how Bibabula's reign. With the victory, the Trump and Miro will treat himself to a hunting trip. Well, okay then. Yeah, look at all that third part of this we got here. Oops, I should have read that. We were victorious, which is great. One of the best times I've actually played that. We must have sent the soldiers. Oh! Whoopsie. Departure of our allies. While well, the war against the Delhi regime was concluded, the Ottoman and German friends have been picking up, packing up to return home. The sun has called out the jihad, and the Germans have left for action the men to continue the expedition. With their departure, the military seems less confident and capable of dealing with the stability that yet remains. Oh well, the Khan, the Khan prospers. People are happy. Descent is non existent, and the Mir's power has never been stronger. Before, a generally hated man, the Mir has been seen a wave of popularity that has ruled never seen before. Well, the state of a rule goes before the war was as little shaky, things have approved, as had Bibullah's gam has proven to be successful. This could spade off, what could go wrong? Our golden age begins now, and King Habibullah's triumph. After a brilliant victory against the vile and treacherous British in the ponds of the Delhi Dominion, thus proving once again Afghanistan's name of graveyard of empires, the power and popularity of our great king has never been higher. The power. The previously used United Tribes now find unity and pride in the newfound Afghan power, and many plots against their sovereign seem to be dis to have dissipated. This is said to organize a great and sumptuous parade in the streets of Kabul. With a huge crowd and all the tribal and political representatives of the country present during the event. At the end of the parade, King Ghazi Habibullah Khan delivered a speech to his people praising the merits of Afghanistan's modernization and his proud army during the Fourth Anglo-Afghan War. To the surprise of his people, the king announced the formation of a new Barakaz 
Barakzai Empire, risen from the ashes of the Duranian Mughals, and that he would lead it to greatness. He left the stage to a loud applause from both his people and the tribal leaders. Meanwhile in Delhi, news of the announcement of Mughal ambitions have been shaken the government to its core. Communications between Delhi and Ottawa are frantic. Fear of another invasion, one which could see the complete annexation of the Raj has paralyzed the British administration. The Anton's grip over India seems to be at its lowest point yet. A new dawn for Afghanistan. Good. Conquer. Wow. Conquer. Oh, look at that. I've never seen that one yet. Victorious and the Conquer. Resistance growth speed minus 50%. All right, then. Not bad. Set off's return. As the war is over and borders are now safe. Now the mortar serves as set offs, and now the first way of the mortar to resume their training within Afghanistan. Sooner our economy will recover. Welcome back. We're ready for round two. Partial mob. What would give us more consumers goods to work with? Of course, I do want an air fleet too at some point as well. Rampant corruption. Oh god. Growing tension is not good. Tribal disunity. A royal hunt. A three-day drive north of uh, northwest of Kabul, deep in the heart of western range of the Hindu Kush, and beyond the extent of the Ka Kamar district lies the Jar Valley. Prized for its isolation, this pristine and unspoiled natural beauty and its ample hunting grounds is isolated and forgotten kite has long forget been the well-kept secret of Afghani nobles and royals seeking a beautiful foray of the world wilds. For traveling here what must be years ago by now Mohammed Nadir, who has long used his gorge as his own personal plot to hunt the very beasts of our lands, or King Habibullah, his most trusted confidence. I have frequently used this strip of wilderness to clear the mind. It was called politics or matters listed in private, or even just it could take an occasional break from the rigors of rule and statescraft. This hunting trip was no different with Habibullah uh, and his retinue leaving their horses back at the entrance of the pass where a small, uh, small rest shack stood, continuing deeper into the wilds on foot, bringing with them only a small amount of survival supplies of traditional gazelles with ample shot and powder, and other various supplies needed for the hunt, such as bait and skinning knives, the royal retinue embarked deep into the heart of this valley of the, valley of the king. In search of noble prey, such as wild boar, imbex, antelope, makor, and if they were so lucky, even snow leopard and Asiatic cheetah. As the sun rose high in the arid and crispy blue sky, their multi-day hunt began with the guards lowered and their spirits high. For it's not like anything ever goes awry in this part or this far from the causticness of civilization. Graveyard of empires, yeah. Hij Hij uh. He's wrapped the movement. They need a Maya hunting expedition. Hunting is tremendous. We love hunting. Disaster strikes hunting party. Oh no! It all happened so fast without any warning or time to think. But tragedy struck, and our glorious King Hababula lies dead at the base of the Jarf Valley. While hunting through the rocky crag of the pass of the final day of hunting trip, the party came to a fabled and magnificent snow leopard, silently making its way to the rock face of some unseen cave or den. Despite the ample amount of antelope or other beasts the party had us so slain, this final quarry would be the perfect cap to an already amazing venture. However, fate had other plans, and as the retinue scrambled the way up the mountain, disaster struck. With the snow leopard finally catching the hunter's scent as the wind shifted, the stark white feline bolted, causing the hunting party to attempt to chase after it. However, one of the nobles in the trip with Hababula lost his footing on the rock, king, the rock face above the king, slipping down the cliff a face by a few meters before regaining his grip. Thinking the words that was behind him and the disaster was just avoided, small sighs of relief and quiet cheers emptied abruptly when the sound of gunfire cut through the valley. Turning back in horror, Hababullah's men saw the Jezail fall from the slipping noble's back, hitting the side of the mountain and misfiring directly into the face of the king. An explosion of pink mist and gray smoke got a the sides of a softball was blown through the head of Hababullah. Oh man! Sending the honor king tumbling down to the valley floor, leaving a red trail behind him as he plummeted lifelessly to the ground. As his men quickly rappelled down on the mountain, rushing to the aid of their wounded king, it was far too late to save him by the time they reached his side. Imagine to gurgle out a swift goodbye through the blood filling his lungs and throat before finally passing, Hababullah died on the floor of the valley surrounded by some of his closest allies. A tragic event if there ever was one. The men wrapped the king's body in gauze and prepared to take him back to Kabul, dreading having to break it to the nation the king was well and truly dead. Crap. Though all in the retinue understood clearly that this was an accident in every sense of the word, the more cynical within the group believed that upon their return, accusations would begin to fly as rival groups vying for power each started to throw blame on one another. What a way to them in Kabul. They will soon see, but the trek back was sure to be a solemn one. A dark star rises over the nation as its beloved king lay bleeding out. In the event, ascension of the crown prince refused to investigate the death. That's the next one we gotta get. Wrath of the Khan. Ascension of the crown prince. Oh, look at that. While well, the country mourns the death of Babu Bula, 
Hababullah and the stage of ship must be moved forward. Nasrullah, the designated heir to Hababullah, is already planning his coronation, but some clamor for an investigation into the death of the beloved former emir, especially since Nasrullah seems a bit apathetic about his brother's death. Well, some attribute this to the new emir's solemn personality, others suspect foul play. Nasrullah was never the power hungry man, but a majority of the public is unaware of the man's personality yet. Prominent figures in the military are divided in the support for the new emir, and some fear another conflict so soon. Nasrullah must, Nasrullah must make a decision either to submit to investigation or resist it. I have nothing to fear from baseless claims. So let's save real quick just in case. Shut him down. A split in the army chooses to stand by Nasrullah. There's in death. Oh, oh look at that. Civil War. Of Hababullah Khan and the subsequent controversy surrounding his death has caused a rift in the army. With two men vying for the throne, Nasrullah and Amanullah Khan, being career military men, the armies begin to choose sides which, between the two candidates. More traditional sects have sided with Nasrullah, while the progressive factions have within fallen behind Amanullah. One hour's man just sees the lion's share and force the other army group to stand down. Who has one on the end? Mm. Old order? Oh, whoops. And then Amanullah flees in exile. Don't purge the army. Amanullah's coup attempt is to collapse under its own falsehoods, and Nasrullah has been freed and restored to power. While Amanullah has fled to Switzerland, there are still many within the army who have to support him. The influence of the young Afghans is so strong, it's almost certain that they will oppose the rifle and mirror with everything they have. If we were to ever return, they would be potentially a fatal fifth column. What are we going to do with them? Leave nothing to chance. Oh no, Nasrullah Khan, welcome aboard. Oh. Sherman control, huh? You can be offensive. So Germans have control of German Crimea, huh? Oh, look at you. Of course, water shortage. Ever-present Russians. Always Russians in C Crimea for some reason. German occupation. I kind of want to play them, see what happens. We'll see. Oh, we need some more daily game for this. Oh, you guys. Oh, Nasrula wins. Nasrula Khan has uh, consolidated his rule against his opposition. His opponents on all sides have been broken, killed, or forced into hiding. The traitor prince Amanullah has fled the country and supporters dwindling even amongst the young Afghans. The army is virtually low to its new emir, and Nasrullah is riding away for popularity begun by his late brother. Other distance have been forced into the mountains where they'll starve and dwindle no away. There's nothing standing us between the emir and his vision for Afghanistan. The world is behind us. Excellent! Oh, autocomplete. That's great. Well, I guess we're returning to the tradition. Nasrullah has alleviated the crisis led by Hababullah's death and seized power instead of his brother. He's taking control of Afghanistan, and with that, he should begin steps towards bringing the nation back into tradition's fold. Pious, or faith in the pious Amir. Afghanistan will not have, got, have to fear its future, for as long as it remains in the good graces of faith and tradition, Allah will protect it from all challenges. Nasrullah will make it so, undoing reform and returning a glorious nation to bask in the grace of Allah. A Turkestan demands, or delegation request support. A Turkestan delegation arrived this morning, requesting support their independent war against the Xinjiang clique. How should we respond? We could provide them with weapons and gold on a regular basis as full support, or we just, just want some special support. Or don't support them at all. So we're here, the Crown Prince ascends. Finally, after decades of careful planning and determination, Nasrullah and Khan now sit on the Afghan throne. His enemies still circle, waiting for their time to strike out, but they'll be dealt with in time. It's up to the new emir to decide the future fate of Afghanistan. Was it possible to see or say what Nasrullah will do? It's almost unmatched zealotry, love of tradition, and alliance with the conservative religious elements of society can give the world a hint as to what the future holds for the country. With East Turkestan. I don't know. Do we. Oh, we prefer these guys, so I don't even bother meeting. I don't know. Maybe we should have supported them. Because they're all paternal autocrats. Oh, no, this makes them decent guns. I know you do industry stuff first, but it's one of the rare times where we're not. And then what? Finalize the ascension? Nasrullah has done and secured his position as Emir. With the conservatives rallying around the new Emir, the great influence over the country has begun to be exerted in Nasrullah's favor. 
Rival factions claim it's in disgruntled citizenry and are slowly dispersing as their support of Baparites behind this ground swell support uh, for Nasrullah. With this throne can secure our Nasrullah can really get down to business now, finally. And instead of trouble fun, so look at that. The decadence of Habibullah and the push of Western reforms and raids of conservative tribes of Afghanistan's hinterlands. They've been rebelling for years left to run right over the countryside while the Amir and Kabul counts as wives. Now, however, their only ally in the royal court, her family, Nasrullah, has taken the throne. And has called a conference in Kabul to settle the tribe's grievances and their and end their incessant fighting. Nasrullah coronated as Amir. With his opponents finally routed and reigned and secured, Nasrullah Khan is formally called a loyal jirga to crown him as the ruler of Afghanistan. Used throughout Afghanistan's history, Pashtun elders have traditionally called a loyal jirga to resolve important issues in the nation, and was importantly that of electing a new leader. Dropping the title of king, which is used during Habibullah's reign, Nasrullah has chosen to be crowned as Amir of Afghanistan. While symbolic gesture, this choice of words reflects the Amir's desire to end many of the former Amir's reforms and favor Afghanistan towards returning a more traditional government. The Shahzada takes his rightful place. And the fate of the minarets. As the Greco Buddhist past was wiped away by Islamic conquerors and missionaries like the Rushidun Arabs, the Ghaznavids, the Umayyads, the Zunbils, the Abbasids, the Gurids Persians, and many more during the rise of Islam between the 7th and 13th centuries. Our Afghanistan was bathed in the light of Allah. To celebrate this divine elevation, past cultures and dynasties built great works dedicated to the new and sole God with ornate mosques and other structures appearing all across their mountain paradise. However, none of these great works compare to the great minaret of Jam and its similar contemporaries like the Ghazni minarets and others like them. Roughly 60 of these minarets and towers were constructed by the great Islamic conquerors of Central Asia between the 11th and 13th centuries to honor their victories and mark their new lands, with many still standing today, not only in Afghanistan, but in places like India, Persia, Bukhara, Kotlin, and Kiva, the most famous of which are being the tallest of them all, the Kutluk Timur minaret in Organj near Lake Sargamish. Not just towers to be forgotten, these minarets have influenced architecture and art in Central and Southern Asia for centuries, with even the most famous Mughal Empire of India copying their designs in many of their great works. However, it seems that this storied legacy was not built to last. After centuries upon centuries of arid weather, sandstorms and earthquakes, and violent conquests all across the region, these minarets, and especially the Minaret of Jam, despite its extreme isolation in one of the most inaccessible regions of the nation, have begun to fall apart. As the verses in the Quran, chiseled in the masonry, begin to decay and intricate brick, glazed town, stucco, all adorned in Kufic and Nashki calligraphy, continues to crumble into dust, and must decide on their final fate. Should we leave these towers to slowly wither, saving state funds but leaving them to their fate under Allah's protection, or should we spend some state funds to declare these sites important to our heritage and history while working to repair them or at least stop them from falling apart? Allah shall protect them. Uh, well, we're paternal autocrats. Leave them be. No. We work through Allah's will. And bring unity to the empire. The instability that plagued the Emirates has come to an end if Afghanistan is to thrive. Various rebellions of equally various size that still roam the countryside, taking advantage of the near anarchy ushered in by the chaos of Habibullah's death. While Nasrullah is a kind to his friends, these rebels are not his friends. All available military force will be used to disperse these rebels and finally unify the state. The Buzz Baz Buzz. Common throughout most of the nation, but originating in the northern mountains, the Buzz Baz is a form of musical marionette puppetry, traditional popular, with people of all ages and commonly practiced by the tribes and clans outside the large cities like Kabul. The centerpiece of the Buzz Baz is a handmade puppet of Marhor, or an Afghan goat, both popular in Islamic imagery for their ability to eat devilish serpents and snakes and believed to have magic powers over man and nature, which is usually carved from wood and adorned in baubles or sequins. Turn the puppet to a string attached to his wrist. The puppeteer moves the goat in a rhythmic beat as they themselves also play music using a dambora or dambra, an Afghan string instrument similar to a guitar, a balaklaika, or flute, syncing the puppeteer's movement to the music at all times. This multitasking musical magic is possible because the goat puppet is on a platform that has a string connected through a pipe to the instrument, creating a one-man band and play that truly is a sight to behold. Wishing to spread this unique piece of Afghan artistic culture to the rest of the nation, Nasrullah Khan has announced the creation of an entire theater dedicated to Buzz Baz performances now opening in the heart of Kabul so that all the nation can experience this traditional art form. May this new uh, venue be the heart of Afghanistan's growing art sector, allowing us to bask in the glories of a culture and aesthetic perfection without abandoning tradition or falling to the art of heret of the art to the art of heretical modernity. Nothing like some quality theater. Also, I accidentally already finished another focus here, but it doesn't really matter. We'll talk about it. All for the commander chief. Most of the army had long rallied behind the old commander chief, however. The reformist officers and soldiers remained hesitant, however. With Nasrullah's rank completely unchallenged and the net leaders cowered or in hiding, more and more they are more switching sides. Now the army stands totally united under their first commander in chief and devoted to the safety and preservation of Afghan sovereignty. We've got this one done. 
and the banditry. The Afghan countryside is almost tailor-made for bandits. Most of the country is in an elaborate limth, labyrinth of caves and mountains. It'll be hard work, but these mountains will be finally combed to smoke out any remaining bandits who wish to make an easy profit. And reverse secularization. Oh, look at that look at power we get. Here's the research speed, but that's okay. Habibullah made great strides in many things, and probably the most egregious was the increased secularization of Afghanistan. The Emirate is tied fundamentally to Allah, so Habibullah's attempts to separate the two are simply laughable. Nasrullah, with the support of his clerical allies, will begin to undo these reforms um, and make Afghanistan right once more. We'll mesh our state into its fundamental religion, so that so much that to try and separate the two once more would be literally impossible. And what do we want next? Uh, we could do this one, yeah. We're going to end the young Afghans. The so-called young Afghans <coughs> don't know what's good for them. They seek progress and modernity in the face of all its hazards. We saw what happened to the progenitor. The young Turks took over the sublime port. The group is already reeling from the exile of their man and the royal family, Amanullah. Nasrullah has ordered the police and army to launch a series of raids on unknown young Afghan hideouts and ordered its leaders arrested. With the leaders gone, the wayward souls will return to the fold and be welcomed. Um, fitting out the expedition. I don't really want to do that one. That doesn't seem really smart for us to do. That's not bad. Or oh, we see the press. Oh, Afghanistan does not have a lot of press outlets already, and most of those we do have are printed. Well, Nasrullah respects. Oh, look at that. Um, now the press and values their independence. You cannot let them run amok. If they print falsehoods, they can destabilize the emirate and throw the nation into chaos. To remedy this, Nasrullah will invite the heads of the largest media companies in the country to meet with them. They won't be outright censoring censored per se, but Nasrullah will make sure clear that falsehoods will be punished severely. I think we really need to focus on the Navy too much. Military High Command. Um, we'll probably just stick with you know military stuff. And by that means armor. Or, or, or artillery. Um, do we have enough equipment? We still need more infantry equipment. What are we doing here? We're building another military factory. Alright. There you go. Alright, good. Thank you, Afghanistan. Um, could no, we don't have enough political power. I wanted to get it sent in attache, but reestablish the Daroga. Afghanistan is the land that almost refuses to be ruled. Its ruggedness and rural nature makes any central control difficult. <coughs> Our additions in India only magnify this problem. To better control uh, the rabble, Nasrullah has returned to the past to establish a Daroga, a local police force in the Mughal Empire. They'll be assigned to governors to be distributed as they see fit, with some within parameters and more, more rural areas will effectively be the government. As such, we shall undergo a harsh vetting. In any case, we already have hundreds of them already with thousands more on the way. That would be great. Um, since we're here, I don't mind training maybe one. Cavalry wouldn't be bad. Are we still using a lot of cav? Outdated tribal military. Yeah, I'll get more cavalry attack and defense. Ending the young Afghans. Well, the dastardly Amanullah already fled to exile in Switzerland. <clears throat> Many of his supporters are still prevalent within the government and the royal army. Fearing a possible conspiracy against his reign when Emir Nasrullah took the throne, many of these seditious um, plotters were allowed to keep their positions with the Emir's rule secured. Uh, we will finally move against Amanullah's remaining loyalists. The most important member of Amanullah's clique is Abdul Hadi Dawi, leader of the young Afghans following the death of Muhammad Mahmoud Tarza. On the mayor's orders, the publishing house of the young Afghan's newspaper was raided by the royal army, where stockpiles of rocks and seditious flyers calling for Amanullah's return were discovered. At his home, Abdul Hadi Dawi was arrested for conspiring to overthrow Nasrullah and instate Amanullah as emir. When the chief conspirator now in her custody, the question of his fate has arisen. Shall we execute this traitor to Islam and Afghan values, or shall we spare his life and allow him to spend the remainder of his miserable days rotting away in prison? Death? Um, I don't want to lose any more stability. We don't get any more base stability every year, so... Um, I like the more political power and command power, but it's also in the most comfortable jail cell. Reversing how Bobo does reforms. Yeah. We need to update our military. Somehow. At least we still have a Hajjat movement. We get more looking manpower. It's not bad. I like this. Travel disunity is pretty bad. Graveyard of Vampires is alright. Still like it. This is not good too. Uh, through the Sakawists. And regarding the brigand king, the most notorious of the bandit rebels is Habibullah Kalakani. He and his brigands continue to be a thorn in our side, trying to pull our nation even further to the right. However, while some in our military government want us and government wants us to outright destroy him, Nasrullah remains hesitant. 
While Kalakani, as it is the most radical, is a little more than a despot, some of his less radical positions are not too different from Nasrullah, and rumor has it that there are talks between him and the bandit king. A stern warning to the press. It has covered Nasrullah's attention that the free press has been acting rather antagonistic towards the current regime. The actions perpetrated by the press have been particularly hostile against his rule, where they have been circulating stories that, that rather brought a great harm towards the image of the emir. Nasrullah has decided to spring to action and arrange a meeting with these many prominent journalists in Kabul. The emir has graciously allowed these publishers to continue their work so long as they cease any sort of articles that even remotely shed a negative light towards the emir and his rule. Otherwise, if these rules are to be breached, the emir will not be as generous. Nasrullah warns that uh, warn them that their publishing houses will be seized and the only papers they will write are letters from the dungeon in the Arctic. Stay in line. That's right. The final fate of the remaining Greco-Buddhist art. <coughs> Although the Greco-Buddhist cultures that once dominated these lands have been gone for a millennia, their footprint still remains, for Greco-Buddhist art still adorns much of Afghanistan despite untold centuries of aesthetic Islamization. The Ukrainian People's Republic. Oh, look at that. Oh. Surviving Greco-Buddhist art and relics of the gorgeous marble high-relief carving, the Bodhivistva and Ka Ka Chandaka made in Hada in the 5th century. The massive Buddhas of Bamiyan, or even smaller pieces of gorgeous metalworking like the golden Bimaran casket, are all great examples of this beauty, culture, and talent of our forgotten past. But these pieces are despised by many traditional Islamists who support Afghanistan's practice of erasing the Greco Buddhist past entirely as a sign of total devotion to Allah. Should we work to finally fully issue the total Islamization process, destroying and replacing the last of this potentially harmful Greco Buddhist influence, or should we allow the portions of our history to remain as it is and always has been despite its heretical nature? Alternatively, we can work to find a new wave of Afghan art, both Islamic and Greco Buddhist in design, in order to revitalize this nearly lost art form and uplift it as one of the many cultural facets of our nation at the crossroads that has always made Afghanistan unique. What should we do? Finish a total Islamization of Afghan art. That's right. Can I see any volunteers? Well, if it makes you mind, I like that, but. We're here to learn. We don't like the British, so we're also going to rely on these guys up here, maybe. It's interesting how big these guys are. And what route did Crimea choose? They also chose the People's Republic. They're also going Social Democrats. It's interesting. So you are literally not in the right spec. This is bad for these guys. The King of Romania, though, is in the Belgrade Pact. That makes it much weaker here. Interesting. Very interesting. Oh, they're just literally just walking in. Supply is pretty bad, though, but whatever. Uh, make the wild card fold. Now, Dear Charles did not allow on the candidates for the throne. Having only lived in Afghanistan for a few decades, he spent most of his life in exile in India. This man with true loyalties a suspect. Up until now, he's made no real effort to take the throne, but Nasrullah knows of his true ambitions and of the fact that he plans on eventually acting on them. Nasrullah will bring Nadir to the table and get him to give up his claim, and if he doesn't, who will miss one more vanished exile? We won't. Good, and then we'll start building more cities, too. Afghanistan's local drug trade. Despite a love for imported opium or other plant-based consumables, the Afghan drug trade is dominated by Naswar. Also called Nas, Nasur, Nasve, Naswar is a moist, powdered tobacco dip that can be found packed into the lips and under the tongues of untold thousands across Afghanistan. Coming in two main forms, a loose powder or a compacted pasty cakes mixed with lime, Naswar, is known for being pungent, holding a powerful smell that resembles that of a freshly cut still wet coastal hay, with this flavor being subtle until it mixes with saliva. The nicotine effect kicks in after about five minutes of chewing, producing a slight burn and numbing irritation on the upper lip and the tongue. The main powder form is made by pouring water into a cement lined cavity, to which slacked lime and air cured sun dried powdered tobacco is added. Later, indigo is added to the mixture to impart its famous bright green color and ash from the burning of juniper bark along with cardamom, oil, menthol, gum, sesame oil, and more can all be often added as flavoring as well while the paste form it's made by taking the prepared powder and adding water to it so that it may be rolled into little balls and set to dry, creating little chewable balls that cause the same effect. Frequently sold on platters alongside sunflower seeds and cigarettes or in their own rolled packets, thus warrants the derivatives are not only important to Afghan culture and a traditional way of life, but as Snar sales both domestically and internationally help fund our economy in a major way, as Naswar was commonly exported to Russia and Eastern Europe, Iberia, and the rest of Central South Asia. Cities like Karat, Banu, Dara Ismail Khan, Charsada, and Mohammed are or Mohmand, are some of the most largest producers of the snus like compound with their sale and productions forming a large part of the urban economy while also enriching the lowly farmers to grow their tobacco in massive fields. With all this in mind, banning Naswar is out of the question entirely, despite its apparent health effects like its ability to cause cancer, but that does not mean we have no dog in this race. We can continue to turn a blind eye to the problem in order to appease the masses or actively tap into this commodity market, helping bring our domestic Naswar business truly boom while taking cut of the profits to further this upon the sea. What should we do?
What would Allah do? We are here for Allah. But do not publicly support it. That's right. And we're going to go to partial mope because I want more. And to build these faster too. Because we've got more of this to take over. They actually took this Bombay away, huh? Oh, but now Nepal's like, ha ha ha. Can I see volunteers? Because you're fighting all those guys and you're going to need some help probably. You guys are only 12 combat with, but you might be able to move faster, so. So when ever Russia is at war, people's revolutionary army, huh? The Red Napoleon's back. Who needed organization or recovery rate? A prince and his cards. Ever since Mohammed Nadir Khan has returned to Afghanistan, uh, the soldier prince has been acting erratically. The prince has been reportedly mobilizing a large force to deal with banditry in our Indian territories. Rumors have it. They are in spread that Nadir Khan is allegedly receiving support from the British Empire. With his loyalties in question, Emir Nasrullah has met with the prince and put these rumors to rest. Uh, in the meeting, the prince has assured the loyalty to the Emir and has informed him of a secretive plot by the local chiefs to overthrow Nasrullah. To bring these plotters to justice, King Nadir Khan has asked the Emir for the position of chief of the army and a generous endowment. Nasrullah was well aware the prince was lying, but he knew that Nadir is a skilled military commander with ambitions to match. The Emir must now consider giving it to Nadir's demands or finally make the so-called wildcard fold. Accept the deal. Arrest. That's fine. Boop. We see through your lies. A reciter ties to Istanbul. The Sultan of Istanbul is both Sultan of the last great caliph and the last caliph of all of Islam. Or of the last great caliphate. Nasrullah, as a deeply religious man, seeks his strength in the ties of the port. Not only is the caliph a religious strongman, but his hold over the Middle East is tenuous but still undeniable. While the Dominion may be gearing up for another round of warfare in alliance with Istanbul, is driving goal that hope in its cradle and make Afghanistan as peaceful as the Middle East. Well, build faster. Welcome aboard. Boop. Boop, boop. Boop, boop. Oh. We have a decent enough field marshal. Sword bearer, it's not bad. I don't like these politically connected though. Hantig and Nidamaya, I don't like that. Everyone's politically connected. Oh, you're not though. Muhammad Wali Khan Darwazi, yes. Very offensive. Um, I don't like that they're going to abandon their capital, but I'm not responsible for the capital, am I? No. Can you do this, though? I like overwhelming firepower a lot, though. You had an encirclement you could have made. Eid, today is the uh, first day of Eid ul Fitr, and all Muslims are celebrating the end of Ramadan. Eid Mubarak. There you go. Two kings enter. For years, has Habibullah Kalakani and his Sakawis have waged war against the reforms of the former emir. Controlling large portions of eastern Afghanistan and the city of Harak, the bandit king's influence is almost parallel to that of the Afghan government. To ensure that only one emir rules over Afghanistan, Nasrullah and his men have traveled into the rugged Khulistan Mountains to meet with Baka in his fortress. After a long conversation, the emir discovered that he and the Banna King shared many similar views regarding the Islamic faith and the vision for Afghanistan's future. Impressed by the new emir, Kalakani is offered to take up arms for the emir in exchange for a lump sum payment of the Baka for the Baka and his men. Nasrullah knew that accepting the Brigand King's offer would enrage the elites back in Kabul, whose caravans and villages had been raided by the Baka and his bandits. The emir also knew that refusing the deal might set off the timid Tajik, and more blood will be shed in the countryside. Nasrullah considered giving Kalakani a counteroffer would be allow the Baka and his men safe passage up north to join Ibrahim Bek and Mujahideen in Turkestan, effectively putting an end to the reign of the Banna King. After much deliberation, Emir Nasrullah has decided to accept the deal. National populace will join the coalition, that's not bad. Present Baka counteroffer. Last national populism, huh? I don't like the release consumer goods factories factor. I don't like getting more cavalry attack and defense. Mm. 
I'm gonna say do the counter offer just because I don't like the effects here. Then not the expedition. The German expedition has remained in Afghanistan for too long. Well, the Kaiser Sultan has been invaluable. The soldiers begin to gather a clique of seditionists, and fifth column is around him, seeking to draw Afghanistan closer to Berlin. It simply cannot continue. While it would be simple to expel them all, do without anger the Kaiser and alien a good friend in the time of crisis. Instead, Nasrullah will send a letter to the Kaiser and ask him politely to draw back most of the expedition. The skeleton crew that remains will be useful to us while also being hobbled as to, to be a threat to Nasrullah's rule. Afghans, Afghans, Afghans. Prize across. Oh, let's go over here. Um, the nobles, regal nobles, and poor people alike, Afghanistan textiles are some of the finest examples of garment making in the world. <clears throat> With local agricultural products and animal produce being used in the creation is both one of our main exports and domestic industries. With silks, yarns, leathers, and threads sourced from all over the country in its various handicraft markets, the beauty and relationships and craftsmanship of our artisanal textile products has been matched by most, leading to this traditional industry being one of the main pillars of our economy. Using making everything from our Parahan Tunbans, Karakuls, Takiyas, Firak or Kat uh, Partugs, Barkas, and other folk clothing from the various tribes and ethnic groups like the bright dresses of the Harzara, or the subdued Nordistani dresses, all the way to our world famous decorative rugs that often tell stories within their weave, or to our famously or infamously comfortable but hold filled blankets, which are also decorated occasionally in gold, silver, mirror shards, and la lapis lazuli to impart value and status on special garments and other textile creations. These garments are the most envy of most. With this historical industry supporting our economy and our culture at once, we are more than happy to continue funding and subsidizing the textile market for the foreseeable future. From the fields of the loom to the market, no value shall be lost. Great. And I'm going to go ahead and try to make these guys thicker because we are going to continue using uh, cavalry here. Or could we use a regular cavalry? You get less soft stack, better supplies, better suppression, better defense, more HP. It might be worth using these guys instead. I don't know. You get more organization, you get more HP, but you lose a slight bit of organization. I think we're fine with what we got right now. Team tank goes up a little bit. Vampire's still the same. I think it'll be fine. Look at that peepee, -pee, though. If anything, we'll go with the Navy. With the subs. Fourth Balkan War, of course. You get down here and defend. There you go. Meeting with the Sultans and the soldier Amir. The Amir is and always will be closely tied to the military. He once ran as a commander in chief, but he led in the battle against the decadent Raj while his eldest brother drowned in decadence, and now he leads him once more not simply as commander in chief, but Amir. His military victories and consolidation of the army behind him have gained him the moniker of the soldier Amir. But Nasrullah would have wanted a more pious declaration, even if he is unable to say it's too far from the truth. A meeting with the Sultan with a while well, the Amir of Afghanistan who frequently hosts state dinners and informal gatherings for his court members influential figures, and diplomats within the country. A u unique occasion rose across and Sultan of the Ottoman Empire was graciously received by the Emir and his court at the Ark. This reception was a token of appreciation for the Ottoman assistance. During the Fourth Anglo-Afghan War, arrived by plane and landing in a small airship in Kabul, the Sultan was accompanied by his entourage and royal guard accompanied by the Afghan army convoy. Upon arrival, he was warmly received and greeted by the Emir and the Afghan royal guard. Notably, the Afghan royal guard performed an impressive drill and salute in honor of the Sultan. Following the ceremony welcome, both the Sultan and Amir, along with their entourages, retired to the palace for dinner and entertainment. During this event, as the guests were engrossed in the generosity of their hosts, the Sultan and the Amir had an opportunity for a private conversation. It was during this private exchange that the Sultan revealed the mounting challenges facing the Islamic world, particularly within the Ottoman Empire. He described the Ottoman Empire as a powder cake with increasing strength of the Cairo Axis and internal discord, border disputes and skirmishes with Iran, along with the escalating tensions in the Levant and the Arabian Peninsula, have reached unprecedented levels. The Sultan, feeling cornered, sought a favor from the Emir to align Afghanistan within, with the Ottoman Empire. He emphasized that the fate of the Ottoman Empire depended on Afghanistan's support in case of a conflict. As he gazed out towards the rooftops of Kabul, the Emir delivered his response to have her support. Let me think about it. Mm, what do we want? The Mughal Empire? I mean, we do want to take out Persia. I do not want to fight Russia. I absolutely do not want to fight Russia. We can guarantee him for now. We get some stuff. Yeah. Oh, you're 
Uh, that was Austrian. Like, you're already killing Austria already? But, okay, cool. But, hey, I think we'll end it there. We've done very well. Um, had a fun time so far, and Russia is uh, a republic. Look at that. Oh, uh, led by national populists. So we'll see what happens. You never know what happens in Kazri So, If you enjoyed the first episode of us playing as the Baraksai Empire, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. And I'll also continue on with good old Afghanistan. Love it. Uh, thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your day.